Our scripture reading uh, this morning, uh, you will find on page 65, I think, in your pew Bible, uh, we uh, indeed uh, want you to uh, uh, at least listen if you do not have a, a Bible near uh, where you are sitting this morning. It is the seventh chapter of Luke, the 11th through the 17th verses. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nan, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. And as he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her was a large crowd from the town, and when the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the casket, and the barrows stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, rise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they were, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. And God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. Then the disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summons two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Then the men, when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist had sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits and had <clears throat> given sight to many who were blind And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news taught to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-loving God, we are grateful for the opportunity to be in your place of worship today, and we ask, O God, that you would open our eyes to see the beauty of your handiwork around us, open our ears to hear your voice as you speak to us, open our minds to understand your message, and our hearts to be receptive to your will. In Christ's holy name, amen. In a few moments, we will, we will have the prayers of the people, but before I begin this message, I just want to recognize all of those who've served in the armed services today. Anybody served in the armed services today? Okay, thank you. Anyone who knew someone who gave the ultimate sacrifice of his or her life in the armed services? Okay, thank you. And this is a day that we can be grateful for the freedom that we have because of the sacrifices of so many who served and even gave their lives for a freedom we share today. In the midst of what we face in life, be it wartime or be it peacetime, how do we deal with the stress that comes to us? How can we in some way stay calm in the middle of a struggle, in the middle of a storm, in the middle of disappointment that often surrounds us and engulfs us? It's a dramatic scene when we look at the first part of this text today. It's a funeral processional that is on the way to the cemetery and it is interrupted. Of course, it's not like what we 
uh, like to see in terms of a funeral processional with black uh, limousines and uh, uh, a long processional of cars. It is more like a processional scene that we may see in the city of New Orleans. Got caught in one one time in New Orleans, and it is a slow march down the street. Everyone is walking and blowing the trumpets as people move a few blocks to the cemetery. It is a scene in which all mourners are there, mourning and crying and wailing. And so that kind of scene, I think, perhaps reminds us more vividly of what is happening in Palestine. It is a Palestinian village called Nan, a short distance from Nazareth, which is Jesus' hometown. Think of it. The man is dead. He is the only son of his mother. The mother is a widow. Indeed, a widow was not looked upon of, of having much power or notoriety in a community. But evidently, people knew her and knew of her plight because there was a great crowd with her as this processional headed toward the cemetery. A large crowd, caring people, showing compassion. But now there is even more than just the wailing and compassion of the people Jesus approaches, apparently coming from Capernaum. When he had just healed the Roman centurion slave, he saw the widow, this desolate mother, and had compassion on her. Can you imagine him saying to her, don't weep? Can you imagine in your deepest sorrow and you are crying and someone says, don't cry. Don't weep, he told her. Her tears for her son, no doubt, mingling down her face with salty tears of remembering also the death of her husband. And so the drama continues. Can you see the modern setting, someone halting the hearse, opening the door of the limousine and telling a widow, don't cry. Then he walks over to the casket and says to the young man, arise. That's startling indeed and startling enough in the first century of Palestine where the tradition of miracles were known quite often like Elijah and Elisha raising widow's sons from the dead. And the young man sat up and began to speak. And like Elijah and Elisha before Jesus, the great prophet gave the son back to his mother. Wow. Talk about rising above the storm of sorrow and disappointment and hurt. Talk about coming before obstacles in life, wondering what's going to happen because your life is now empty. You've lost a husband, you've lost a son, and all of a sudden that sadness, that disappointment, that sorrow is dispelled. Talk about overcoming life's defeats. This is it. Jesus raises this young man from the dead as he had Jairus' daughter and Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha. In this miracle of physically raising a son from the dead, just as healing many who were sick, in reality dispelled a storm of disappointment, a storm of grief and sorrow. But what he did then, he still does today. So how can we stay calm in the midst of a storm of disappointment, the storm of sorrow, the storm of rejection? The first thing is don't deny reality. Don't deny reality. That's tough sometimes. How do we rise above a storm that's happening in our lives 
For one thing, we do not deny that the storm is real. Biblical scholar William Barclay says, we live in a world of broken hearts. Indeed, we do. Any daily newspaper account or any newscast on the TV, uh, you know, tells us of, of death and fractured relationships and broken dreams. And indeed, we need not turn to any newspaper just for that account. All we can think of is look into our own lives, our own family histories, we have only to look at our own friends and neighbors and family to recognize how hurtful life can be and how disappointed and how many storms we walk through. We have only to look at our own lives and our own hearts when we have broken hearts. Jesus, the healer and power giver, never insulted people by telling them their problems weren't real. He never told the sick that they weren't really sick. He never told people that death wasn't real, nor did he offer this widow mother words of just soothing her grieving heart. Many, many years ago, there was a young girl that I'd watched grow up in the church where I was serving, and her husband went to work one morning fine and well, he had a cerebral hemorrhage and died. By this time, uh, she had uh, joined the church where her husband was a member and was not Presbyterian, but I went to visit her. And she said, Reverend Briggs, but tell me that, that Willie B. is not dead. And I said, I can't tell you that, Edith. He is indeed dead. Some of the members of the church where she was a member of said, don't tell her that. It says she's got to recognize that is real. The reality is there, and now we have to deal with what really is. Off too often in life, we act as if reality does not exist in our lives, that whatever is happening to us is not real. And we walk around and pretend it is not real. You see, my friends, we think about it. When we think about it, life offers struggling, disappointing, hurtful things to us, and these things are real. Are you out of a job? Did you have your home decline in value? Are you financially poor? Or are your finances dwindling? Did you lose money when the economy fell several years ago? Those things are real. Are you enslaved in a kind of debilitating habit? Then don't deny it, says Jesus. The widow never said her son wasn't dead. Admit the problem. Don't deny it. That's the first step in staying calm in some way and dealing with the storms of life that we face from time to time. It is real. Second thing is we have to consider the alternatives, consider the possible solutions. How are we to stay calm in the midst of disappointment? We need to have courage to consider alternatives. A, a counselor was counseling a woman in a very troubled marriage and, and uh, after several sessions got her to understand the problems were real and that she needed to be one who was committed to do something about it. But when it came to considering alternatives, she was close-minded. Her husband was abusive and would not, under any circumstances, consider counseling. Why not get a separation or a divorce, he said. She couldn't for the sake of the child, she said. But the child will soon be grown and gone, and besides, he, your child thinks you need to get out of the relationship. She then stated she could not afford to move out. But he said, you already have a gainful employment. And from what I'm told, your income is good. 
But she replied, without his income, I, I will not be able to live on the same, same economic level that I live now that I'm accustomed to. And so it went on. She was indeed very unhappy in the marriage and had been for a long time. She was very discouraged, even to the point of despair, and perhaps even flirted sometime with even giving thought to the possibility of suicide. And yet she refused seriously to consider any alternatives to the current situation. Well, here's a man who loses a job a job that paid him very well. He had two cars, a large mortgage, kids in private school. Job market's tough. And he refused to get a job that paid less money than the previous job he had. So he refused to become employed again and ended up losing it all because every job opportunity that came to him, he said, was beneath his training. You see, my friends, it was Jesus who told the sick, have faith, stand up and walk. It was Jesus who said to the blind, do you want to see? It was Jesus who said, take up your cross and follow me. It was Jesus who said, if you have faith, you can move mountains. In all of these situations, everyone that Jesus spoke to wanted somehow to do better and looked at the alternatives. Oh, you think of one, the rich young ruler said, hey, give up everything you own and, and, and sell it. Give it to the poor. He couldn't afford to. He didn't take any alternatives, so he walked away with his head down. It was Jesus himself who refused to be defeated by circumstances. Instead, he considered alternative ways of thinking and acting. That's what made him such a revolutionary savior. Want to stay calm in the midst of disappointment? Then... Let go of the past. Let go of what used to be. The dead ends that we run into. Let go, if need be, the large home. I remember when our son graduated, he's the oldest of our two kids. That was okay, because our daughter whom you said met that comes to church. She, she, she was still home, they were five years apart. So I, I was happy that she was there. But then when she graduated from high school, I was devastated for a while. Tried to get my wife, let's go adopt a couple of kids. <laughs> she looked at me and said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> but there I was, I, 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 I had to find something, oh, some alternate way for this love of children that, that I had within me, that, that they were gone and they didn't have any kids. And, 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 and so every time there was a fair or, or a carnival or, or anything going on in the community, I grabbed me a couple of kids so that I wouldn't look funny, an old man riding a Ferris wheel by himself. <laughs> But, 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 but you see, my friend, we have to consider the alternatives. Don't, don't let that love that you have in your heart die because your kids are gone. Shed it. Share it. Give it to someone else. As I said to a family years ago, who had gone through a time of, of, of strong grief, I said, I was kind of like this son. I was my mother's only child. And I said that, that after mother died, a lot of people, I had a lot of mother figures step into my life. And I said, you got to love them, that love that you had for someone who has passed away. Don't let that love die because they are not here anymore. Give that love away. Give it to somebody else. That's an alternative to sadness and loneliness in our lives. Let that love come alive and touch the lives of many. 
There was a young lady in uh, Orlando, and a pastor in Orlando many, many years ago, and this girl was, a, was an only girl and, and a single parent, and she was a loner. She became a part of the youth program and spent a lot of time with her. She knew nothing about anything. We, we went go-kart riding. When go-kart riding was a big deal. And, and, and I had to jump on the track and catch her go-kart and, and help her stop it. <laughs> and a lot of other firsts we did together. And, and when I left there, she wrote me this long, long letter of what it meant to have somebody a part of her life that seemed to care about her. That young lady has since died, but I still got that letter in my good letter file. <laughs> <laughs> so we look at the alternatives of what we do when, when life presents to us difficult times in our lives. But, but, but more than recognizing that, that storms are real in our lives and looking at the alternatives, we must also be thirdly and lastly touched by Christ. How do you stay calm in the midst of a storm of, uh, of disappointment and hurt and grief and sorrow? We must allow ourselves to be touched by Christ, by the transcendent power of Jesus Christ. One of the surest ways to discouragement and death is to assume that all reality begins and stops with you. Some people believe that if they have not thought it, it isn't true. If they haven't experienced it, it isn't real. The whole reality is therefore defined by their own narrow perspectives. Too often people become discouraged because they have allowed their own world and self-understanding to collapse in around them. Many discouraged and despairing people are su suffocated in their own deceit. They get caught in the grips of doubt and refuse to doubt their own doubts. In contrast to this, Jesus calls us to be open to the divine in prayer and in humility. In other words, my friends, when we are caught in the sorrow, look at what is real. Caught with what is real. The second part of that scripture that I, that I read that, that was not in your bulletin is, is where John the Baptist is in prison and he knows his, his death is imminent and he hears this stuff and so he wants to be certain before he dies that Jesus is the one. So he sends two disciples and, and, and want them to ask Jesus, are you the one that we're supposed to be looking for or should we wait for somebody else? In other words, before I die, I want to know if you're the real thing, Lord. Jesus doesn't say to them, you, tell, you go tell John, sure, I am the Messiah. No, he tells the disciples, go tell John reality. Go tell John what you see and what you hear. Go and tell him what is real. Go and tell him, you see the blind receiving their sight, the lame able to walk, the dead being able to be raised, and the, the poor having a good news preached to them. Go and tell John this. In other words, go and tell John you see people being touched by the Spirit of Christ. That's what Harry Orstick did, the famous preacher of Riverside Church in New York many years ago, called the, the pastor and build that big church back by the Rockefeller family fortune. Uh, you know, it was in, he said, the most terrifying wilderness I've ever traveled through when I went there. I wanted to commit suicide at times, he said, but instead made some of the most vital discoveries of my life. My little book, he, he wrote, the meaning of prayer would never have been written without the breakdown that I had. 
I found God in a desert. And then I believed. We are forever learning that God is for us, not against us. It is we who are against ourselves and our narrow views of life, our fears, our anxieties, our arrogance, our stubbornness. Many of us are slow learners in a way. We refuse to allow God to touch us with a new idea. You know how it is. We never did it that way before. <laughs> we, die, we dare to take the new job opportunity for fear we might fail because we're so familiar with the present one. The new uh, vital power that God gives us, we, we refuse to take advantage. All because we got our minds made up and we know what we want to do and where we want to be and do not allow God to have his way in our lives. So what am I saying? I'm saying that when we face trials and tribulations in our life, we need to recognize that they are real. Don't ignore them. Don't act as if they don't exist. Second thing is we need to look at the alternatives. And then we need to be touched by Jesus Christ. That's what happened to this boy on the way to the cemetery. He was touched by Christ. It was the divine power of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ touch on this young man as he was lying in the casket in Nan on the way to the cemetery. It was a dramatic sight, but it was real. And after having been touched, he arose from his state of death. But you see, in our time and in all times, the power of the living Christ enables people to remain calm in the middle of disappointment, in the middle of despondency, in the middle of despair, and from even death itself. The Bible and other good books of the world and the churches are full of stories of how God helps each one of us overcome, become above the storms that we face every day. And as Jesus said to the young man in Nan long ago, so would he say to each of us each day, young man, old man, young woman, old woman, young child or old child, arise. For I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Though you may struggle, there is power in the touch of Christ in the middle of your struggle. Most of us would agree that if we've had any growth in our lives that have been significant, that growth has come when life was tough. The obstacles that we have overcome or they make us strong. Those of you who've served in the armed services, no doubt you too served in a time when there was fear and wonder and anxiety, but it was the touch of Christ that got you through it all. And for those who gave their lives that we might have our freedom, they too recognize the fact that though they did not make it out alive, yet it was God's spirit who was with them and sustained them even in death. May God's grace be upon you and may God's peace be with you. Amen.